One thing outside of combine settings, which I'd normally take this chart, the most current one, and set the machine up to the these settings, like concave openings, your rotor speed, your sieves, fan, and all that. The one thing we do here quite a bit is your funnels, where to properly set them, like you got your thresher loss. Well, this one here, it's set at 20. I'd normally put that closer to 30 especially when you're starting out because that would be you know if you got green beans or wet or corn that's more susceptible of running them over then on your sieve loss this one they normally come out at 25 from the factory that's a pretty good setting but in greener beans you get the green holes going off the back of your sieves and it will set that and it'll run that real high in these funnels so there is where I would drop it on back to 20 and try to leave it set in there and that would keep your sieve loss somewhere in here also if you want to see sieve loss uh, you could be looking on your chaff spreader on your rear axle to see if the beans are coming off the back they'd be piled in the trash if it's thresher loss Another good place to look is on top of your straw chopper, the spreader hood. They'd be, they get blown out and they get blown up through the, the slots and they'd be laying on the back. The other thing is the returns. I normally leave return settings up towards 50% because that's going to let you know if your sieves are closed too far, your cleaning sieve, and it's dumping most of it back into returns. Soybeans, you do want most of those unsplit holes going back through the returns to get you know maybe one or two beans knocked out of the holes so then they're they're actually out so leaving that high and even if this is running halfway up that's at least letting you know you've got returns going back through but if you start seeing split beans in the grain tank that's where you might want to either open the lower sieve one notch or be looking at opening the concaves up one notch or slowing the rotors down like 20 RPMs or vice versa. So that's some of the settings with the, the loss funnels. The, the ASP, the, the advanced stone path, stone protection. Normally we run 60, 70% in beans and down closer to 20 to 30% in corn. These newer, if it's these tier four combines like the 6090 and even newer, the way they sense everything, we have actually left this set at 80% and run corn and beans with it. And it's just the way it, everything gets amplified in corn that it senses, it, it won't keep kicking the rock trap open. We jump back into the 900 series combines and a lot of those were having to run closer to 50% in beans and down around 20% on all the time in corn. So I know some people don't mess with this, some people do, but at least on these newer machines, we can leave it set at a high sensitivity and just leave it alone. It doesn't matter. Um, feeder speed, <clears throat> that's another one. If especially if you haven't ever had a draper head and you get a draper head the question is is i can't speed up 
and slow down my feeder RPMs. My draper head is set at one speed only, 585 RPMs. So just say you had your corn head on it running 700 RPMs, as soon as you put a draper head on, the combine will automatically slow itself down to that proper RPMs and it'll stay there. So. so another thing we run into is quite a bit of, of uh, warning codes popping up, line disconnected. It'll usually tell you if it's uh, if it's on the head, it'll say left or right skid plate sensor. It's either the wires got unplugged, uh, starting out the season. Uh, the first thing is if the header height works. Uh, on bean heads, they got the wiring harness running across the top beam on the auger heads. Mice get in there and start chewing wires up. That will pop up. Corn heads, kind of the same way. Um, on the combines themselves, one one area we've seen on them is um, on our yield our factory yield sensors up in the top of the grain elevator. There was another area we've seen them say line disconnected, and they wouldn't read yield. Well, you get up there, and all it amounted to was either they had corn wedged in the sensor plates, and it it was throwing a false reading. And the combine thought it, it was way above or way below what it's supposed to read. So it's mainly just cleaning them out, is, is taking care of them. If it had an ag leader in it, that's a full stand. It's completely separate from the combines, so we, which we've never had the problems with. But usually it will tell you um, so, like this one right here was the fault that code was popping up yesterday. And at least it tells you on the monitor, water and fuel. What that means is the fuel filter underneath the fuel tank, the sensor is sends moisture in the fuel. Best way to check it is to change the, take the uh, sending unit out of the bottom of the filter, see what drains out of it. Just kind of a warning there. But you can see here all the codes that popped up. You know, we had a head mounted on it yesterday. We had a problem with the right hand sensor, which it, you know, all it amounted to is the wire was unplugged. So, and like this one, it'll go in and it'll tell you that it's shorted low, which means when it's unplugged, it's low. Mm -hmm. If it was grounded to mainframe, it'd be high. So this is how many times it's it, this combine has sensed that problem. It's done it 63 times since this machine was new. I use it more for for. Uh, if it's been a problem over the last so many years, you know, okay, this is something we need to look at. I want to go to toolbox. This is going to primarily be when we set headers up. If you've traded heads or uh, upgraded or something, you need to go in and set up the head itself. Okay, this machine here. We're running a Draper Vary feed. If you've got a corn head, okay, so one thing we've got to make sure is setting up the proper header types. Like most, most of our corn heads are all going to be rigid. Uh, this one's actually going to be running an eight row. Make sure they're set on 30 inch row spacing. And then go to head two. What I do is on auto float, that's for the header height, without the head being mounted on a combine, I turn it not installed. As soon as the head's mounted on the combine and plugged in, I put it to installed. Then this is really crucial on the 900 series combines. If you're running a corn reel on it, you need the hydraulic reel drive. If it's a newer style corn head that's got the rotating augers on the end of the snoots, mm -hmm. you need it hydraulic. If it's just a straight corn head, just hydraulic deck plates only, no augers, no reels, we would always need to make sure that's mechanical. These newer machines, if it doesn't sense flow through those couplers going out to the head, it'll actually disable the reel drive. The 900 series will not. 
and what it'll do is it'll get the hydraulics hot and it'll wind up taking out the hydraulic pumps. Okay. And we have noticed several several machines, I don't I think it's when the batteries run dead, somehow that feature right there gets turned back to hydraulic. So it's something on a more so on a 900 series I really watch. So, but if you're setting up, you know, trading heads and uh, why did my augers run? Or why did my reel run? You always need to make sure that the reel drive on a corn head is set up. Of course, bean heads, they all, all need to be set to hydraulic. Um, the other thing on a draper head, and this is for all of them, it says header knife fore aft. We can't, they use a cylinder to tip the head forwards and backwards for cutting height and also the degree of how the how close you want to cut to the ground so you need to install it and then button on the front reel for and back or that will sit there and rotate the head back and forth okay if you've got rotating augers or a corn reel on a, on your head same thing press that one and use that and that'll speed up and slow down your augers on your corn head or your reel so that's been the other big question that's been asked okay. so uh, header lateral tilt you'd need that installed now on a draper head we just don't install it because the heads most of them don't tilt mm -hmm. so that's what that's all about so. calibrations I know they talk and they preach about calibrate needing to calibrate the header every year um, if you put it on you know before harvest put the heads on fire everything up hit the resume button it all goes down seems to float no codes tip it to the left tip, or tip it to the right drop it and it all levels back out say good enough but if that head goes down and it doesn't look like it's cutting right in fact I just run into one the other day I know we've calibrated it in the past but for some reason it's on a corn head it's got two different settings that's one and this two but when it was flipped into two on the corn head where are those settings at? Uh, right here one and two so what happens when you flip it into two for a higher cutting height and with that corn head as soon as you hit your resume button, the head would tip to the right, hit the ground, and it'd sit there. And all and everything was fine with the corn head. It was just a matter of recalibrating the header too. So what I've been doing with all almost all these combines is I calibrate it with that switch flip to one, and then when I'm done with that, I flip the switch to two and calibrate it in two. It gives it um, at least it memorizes uh, the values of those sensors so that would be mainly the header as far as the rest of them uh, sieve openings uh, these this is only if we had replaced an electric actuator okay. that's when we got to go in and start calibrating these uh, concave openings if if this con if if the combine if the older they get naturally you're going to get more wear in your threshing area. Your concaves are going to get worn down more. Your rasp bars are going to get worn down more. You set it to this. It still doesn't thresh right. You keep tightening the concaves up, tighten them up, tighten them up. A lot of times I, after you get like 1500 hours on a separator up closer to 2000, the concave opening, I go in and actually physically measure the distance between rasp bars and concaves. It's supposed to be one inch when you calibrate them. If we're closer to an inch and a half, then we need to physically raise the concaves closer to the rasp bars and then go in and recalibrate the concave. Um, these newer machines, this feeder engagement, uh, and we're dealing with all of our anything newer than uh, 2012. Feeder engagement is, is how harsh that head's going to engage. So if you go from running a six row corn head on here and then you throw an eight row corn head on here and you've got two more row units you gotta open up, you know, get running, what'll happen is the combine, the feeder house will bang into gear pretty hard. So 
we need to unhook the drive shafts and go through feeder engagement calibration. Walks you right through it. Then it starts, it, then it senses how much load it takes to get that head to start running. Kind of the same thing with the grain heads. You go with bigger grain heads, it takes a little more to get them opened up. So that is one thing I've heard, you know, why does my head bang into gear so hard, you know, and especially after they've traded heads, putting a newer head or a different head on that same combine. So, and uh, that's something like, I can walk them through it, but it's it's uh, very simple on the calibrations. Okay. So maximum work height, that is one where it tells you how far up you want this head to raise, and that will stop the acre counter. So you physically raise and lower, you know, just say I want, with the bean head, I only want that thing to raise maybe like right there, you'd hit okay. What will happen is a lot of, a lot of these combines, the head will come all the way up. The guys in the hills, yeah, they do. They want their headers up off the ground, by the way. So. Zeroed in. <coughs> Those are some settings I, I definitely change. Area, that's just, um, you got to go in and basically track it out, you know, once you're going around the field, box it in. Not too many people really worry about the area, but that's mainly making sure you got your full header widths and your stop heights all set. The one thing we found out about area, if you're manually raising these things up and down and not using the R button to lift and lower the headers, sometimes you don't get above the um, uh, stopping point of the acre counter, especially if you're in a mapping position. You'll see your lines in your end rows and I'll start adding acres to it start screwing up the maps it looks like you you've already harvested it but then you drive over it well then it, it just messes everything up because where we noticed it at was on variable rate planters and variable rate anhydrous toolbars they'd be doing the end rows and they'd go right through a couple places where the headers weren't up high enough and the anhydrous toolbar started shutting off and the planter started uh, dropping the rate the seed rate down because it already thought it was planted and it wasn't so that's where we try to use you know if you're in a mapping position that's where you need to be using the R button as much as you can and making sure that headers up above the stop the, the acre counter stop stopping point so uh, crop type <clears throat> this is another one same thing with with um, uh, Ag Leader and New Holland. We've been finding out, you know, this is what they come from the factories, the trade weight. So most of our weights anymore are up closer to 59, 60, 61 pound trade weight. So we're having to go in and change our trade weights a little higher because it's given us an in inaccurate yield, you know. Just say what uh, semi held versus what the combine measured, you know, we might have like a 80, 90 bushel difference. And usually we, we found out it's actually with the trade weight. So I've been taking these and putting them up closer to 59 because that seems like where most of our weights have been here in the last few years. The other thing, crop trade moisture on corn, 15.5, well, that's, you know, grade two. <laughs> that's number two corn, you know, basically dried down. So I found out when you're taking it out of the field, you're not you're not taking number two corn out. So I've been taking that up a little closer to 16 to keep the uh, moisture a little bit closer to accurate, you know, because I guess that, especially soybeans, especially the seed beans, you know, you, you got a fine line there where you can uh, take them out of seed beans. You can't get above what, 15% or 14%, I think. Yep. And you definitely don't want to be down around the 10%. You want to, 12 and 13 is ideal. So same thing with corn, you know, we're taking 20% corn out. You want it to be as accurate as possible to let you know that, especially if you're putting it in a bin. So, so it's a couple things. I, the ag leaders, you can change them too. Um, so. Moisture in our yield um, on the factory settings, 
um, it'll tell you, it walks you through it, tells you what you need to do for calibrating. So you'd start there, and that is something, uh, the moisture's real simple to do. I'm going to back out of this one. I normally use advanced. Then you can put your crop type, you got to have your grower, your farm, your field, and a task. And then it'll walk you through there, and then you can actually put inputs in of what was actually measured for weight to uh, zero in on your yield a little more accurately, and the same way with your moisture. Moisture, you can do it with a handheld tester or whatever your cards are, you know, your ticket's coming back in town or whatever. Or you can use the grain card, you know, for your yield. As long as you know it's accurate, you can set that up and get your proper weights in there. So um, I know that's been a big question. Usually from year to year, the moisture doesn't change. The yield does. The reason the yield changes so much is because of grain elevator wear. The chain, the, the plastic paddles get worn down a little more. The other thing is chain tension. If the chain starts getting loose, it's going to show a lower yield on an average or it's going to be a very erratic yield you know if you know that going across the field yeah it might in corn it might change 20 bushel up and down you know but if it starts going 100 bushel then usually the elevator chain needs tightened up or you know you got something else going wrong so the yield has been you know from year to year i've seen that change quite a bit so moisture on an average no usually the moisture if and it's no different than an ag leader setup or a factory setup if the value doesn't change at all and it stays on one number then usually the auger's plugged or you got a blown fuse back there for the auger the motor and everything so just need to clean it out put a new fuse in it so yield if it gets stuck at one number that's usually something's wedged in the sensor up in the grain elevator at the very top. Okay. So that's usually, when a yield doesn't change, that's usually where the problem lies. Normally it's gonna change, it, you know. If the sensor was bad, it's gonna tell you, pop up on there that the yield, uh, like line disconnected or yield tear out of range, you know, that's gonna tell you something's wrong with actual sensors. broken off bolt it was broke off two years ago I said just run it until we get the combine in the shop and it's never broke anymore he's always had the bolts with him just in case but, um, but if you start getting three and four of them broke off then it's time to do something with those wheel bolts because eventually it's gonna start breaking them all off and then do a little more. side tires and we try to run five pounds less four to five pounds less than the duels uh, a lot of them I went and road on the valve stems the reason it's just no different a tractor you start crossing ditches you want to you want the tires to give a little bit yeah front the uh, asp feeder houses uh, the, the drum height has been really crucial we normally always set the height on number three down there for beans and then we crank it up to five for corn um, if you know you don't have any rocks or anything like that, we got by it, turned it to four, and run corn and beans both at that setting. Okay. Um, if you're running a, just say you're gonna run a 30 foot bean head and a six row corn head on this combine, I would set it to three and just leave it at three. Okay. Don't even adjust it. Just change your sensitivity on the older machines. But, okay. Uh, How about the quick connect? Uh, hydraulic over here. Is there anything to nothing, look out for that? Nothing real special about it. You can always unhook it under pressure. The one, the only thing we've noticed is always make sure you wipe those off on the combine and on the head before you couple them up. Yep. What'll happen is if they got dirt on them, these pins get pushed in and the dirt gets stuck and then when you uncouple it there's a seal in there and eventually it'll blow that seal out because these pins aren't shoving back and forth as far as they need to. Okay. You cannot replace that little seal. You gotta get the whole stem that threads into this block. Okay. 
the other thing is when you're unhooking and taking these heads on and off seems like this wiring harness sure gets forgot a lot it does and you wind up ripping all the wires completely out of this the older these combines get if you see all these wires you're going to see a whole bunch of blues a whole bunch of yellows a whole bunch of pinks and there's numbers on them that's how we can identify which wire goes in which hole in here by numbers yep and the older these combines get you can't read the numbers <laughs> so we've usually got to go cutting on back further so we can find wires we can read so okay i guess i one of the first things i'd normally do is i always unhook the electrical one first okay and then unhook the hydraulics and then you know release the latch the okay. thing about feeder chains is um, if something did go in it and they've got bent slats if these like we've got a we got quite a few of them they get rolled like this part here gets rolled over the top of these bolts yep. that really doesn't hurt nothing but this thing's bowed in an arch or got a real severe dent or it's broken half i definitely get rid of that bar take it out okay. get it straightened replace it you can take them out and run it without you know if it's just one or two you can take them out and leave them out until you can you know get it fixed but what happens it'll just prematurely wear that chain and eventually it'll break the chain okay so uh, that one is kind of hard when you got the heads on but just say you're greasing the machine or if you heard something go through it at least you can uh, run the feeder reverser uh, make sure that the, the, all your slats are straight so okay. and that's another thing while we're talking about the feeder reverser that we normally do run them when we run them through here we run the feeder reverser but after these combines set a full year from the previous fall before you start run your feeder reversers engage them run them forward run them backwards make sure they engage because what what i see is up underneath where they the collar's got to slide they get real sticky in yep. so uh, there's been a lot of them they go out to the field run a slug in the combine feeder they said well my feeder house won't reverse and normally all it amounts to is collars and stuck it's not sliding here is you know at least at the spring okay. so when you walk around just looking at belts or anything like that they've got those little gauges just make sure they're tightened up that'd be it. just this yes piece of metal yeah, here yeah okay just tighten it down to where that spring is flush with it I hit those yeah. every day try to hit your lower hour bearings as much as possible there's no grease circs on this machine that you can't over grease the rotor bearings those two right up in there would be two of them i'd say when you do grease them just don't over grease them yep um you know uh, a regular handheld grease gun a couple pumps plenty good if it's an, a cordless grease gun one or two cycles out of it's good enough uh you start giving it five six seven eight cycles it's going to push grease out the front or out the back and then if they go out the back of course dirt gets into them and then the rotor yep. bearings go out okay so um and those, the, those are on a weekly basis yeah something like that most of these okay. grease certs are all going to be 50 hour yep so a lot of guys if you're only going to run just say you run say 600 acres and that's it grease it before beans grease it before corn pretty good rule of thumb yep so perfect and as far as walking around the machine you know i look at feeder chain tension uh they've got spring gauges on everything just make sure the end of the gauge right This one, you just open the door. You want to be able to slide the chain back and forth across the gears like this. And then I kind of whip, I kind of grab the whole chain and I try to whip, you know, it shouldn't be real loose. This bolt should never be turned. You usually want to loosen this nut up, thread this nut down, it'll shove this rod up, and that's what's going to tighten up that chain. Okay. I've seen too many of them loosen one turn the bolt break that nut off or it'll bend this bracket right here okay so it's always loosen this one tighten this one and then that'll push it up so, so the bolt itself don't touch it yep don't touch okay. the bolt one i try to do this when they're new is i loosen this up and i make sure that that bolt is threaded up here and it's tight because this is just a nut welded on a piece of flat metal so when you tighten that all the way into it 
it locks the bolt so it can't turn. Okay. So, and this is probably on machines that are going to get a lot of hours put on it in the fall, and I'm talking three, four hundred hours. So if they're tightening this chain, say, once a week or something, or twice a week, right up there, and this is going to pertain to the 9000 series combine, the later 9000s and these newer ones, that spring and that rod right up there, that tightens that drive chain for this elevator that runs the whole thing. Yep. There. That one right yep. there. Okay. So that one, when we tighten up the main elevator chain inside, it actually starts raising that one up. And I've okay. run into a few of these combines, they tighten this one up so much, it bottomed out that spring, and it actually broke the 60 drive chain that runs this whole thing. No kidding. So when I tighten this, I look up at that spring and just make sure it's not completely compressed. So, and that's a drive chain up there. Uh, if you can oil them, great. Uh, I, most combines, I replace that chain yearly just because of the load it's, it's pulling. And it's hard to oil it. Some yep. guys believe in oil and chain, some don't. But anyway, it's a it's a very high wear chain. That's one chain on this machine, that's it. Okay. And it wears it wears rapidly. So one other thing as far as the surface side of it, as far as greasing, is our torque sensing shiz for the rotor and the very front one up there for the feeders. They've got grease circs in there that grease the inside. That one right there. The other thing is, is on the back side of that pulley, there's two rollers, one on opposite sides. It's got grease circs. And they are the rollers that travel up and down the cams. The, the older combines, the uh, 900 and the 9000 series, that shiv up there and that rotor shiv is going to, they're going to have circs on the back side. Okay. If a person can keep them greased up good. The other thing is, when you start the season off, grease it all up, speed the rotors all the way up, slow them all the way down, speed them all the way up, slow them back down to wherever you had them set. Do the same thing with the feeder speed. Okay. And that way it'll get the grease completely slid back and forth with all the cams inside of it. And this is another thing on feeder speed. And this is one of our We've had quite a few guys, they've got draper heads, and they say, well, they don't have their head on the combine, said my feeder speed won't speed up and slow down. It stays at one speed. Well, if the combine thinks it's got the draper head on it, it won't speed up and slow down. It locks it out. That's where you gotta go back into that monitor, go to your header section, and just switch it to a corn head. Yep. Then it will speed up and slow down. Okay. So, if it thinks it's got an auger head, a grain head, It'll speed up, but it'll only speed up to a, like 600 RPMs. Okay. Older combines will only speed up to like 350 or something. So. That's the water and fuel sensor. They've all got them. So this one here, we just put a new fuel filter on it, but I think we put it on last winter and it got gelled up. So okay. Usually when you're dealing with fuel filters, cold cold weather gel up, you might as well just throw new fuel filters on it. Yep. You'll never get thawed out. Uh, mainly filling this thing, they've got a filter up there in that, in that neck. And it kind of goes the same way with the fuel filler neck. We've talked to, talked to a lot of people, they said, well, our strainer screens go. No. Well, it usually breaks off, falls down in the tank. So I usually say you need a strainer screen. Make sure you got the strainer screens in the fuel tank. That one in the depth, if you flip the tab down, you can see it down in there. If it looks like it's got a hole in it, you can take like three or four screws out, and then you can pull that filter, that strainer out, put a new strainer in it. Okay. And always keep your nozzles and everything as clean as possible. The other thing with depth is when you store them, I know several guys have always left the fuel tanks completely full of fuel. That was pretty crucial on the old uh, TR combines with metal fuel tanks, keep them from rusting. These plastic ones really don't matter. Okay. Leave them full, leave them empty, or whatever. The DEF tank, on the other hand, we want, a, I've been saying if you can, the 
last day or two you've run with that machine, try to get the depth level down around a quarter, quarter of a tank. Uh, a lot of guys are filling them up, and after they set a year and they start running them, it never moves. It stays full all the time. The other thing was we started having derating problems because the quality of the depth weakened, kind of like antifreeze. Yep. So we, I say just uh, leave them down around a quarter, at least below a half. That way the next season you can go in and dump new depth in it and it all mixes together. And then uh, you don't have near the problems with the depth systems. Rotary screens. Um, there's brushes all the way around that thing. I try to get them as clean as possible because that'll help keep from sucking all the dust in it. The older combines, the 900 series, uh, really all you're doing is you're just uh, pulling air across the coils, your radiator, your hydraulic coolers. So if you start running high um, hydraulic temperatures or engine temperatures, that'd be the first place. And then if the air conditioner and the combine are performing good enough, make sure the coils and everything are cleaned out. Okay. You jump into 9000 series and newer, they started sucking all their air for their air filters through. They start getting filters plugged up daily or in just a few hours. There's ports in there and it'll start, and corn especially, it'll start sucking the little leaves, all the, all the chaff in there and that'll actually get plugged down inside the air cleaner ductwork. It's an aspirator. Yeah. And we run into at least three, if not four, machines, especially the 9000 series. We got to tear that all apart, and it's just completely packed. Bean, bean fuzz, you name it. Yeah. So that's where those brushes, you want to keep them, try to keep them clean. If it's a 30 foot or larger head, or eight row and uh, six and eight row corn heads. I normally set that in the mid position and I'd leave it alone. Okay. That way you're getting on the pre sieve all the material coming off the grain pan. We're trying to get roughly 25% of the grain through the pre sieve and it takes it straight down to the lower cleaning sieve. And, it, and then it lets all the, the trash, that's mainly grain going down there, then the trash can come on out on the, on the top sieve. So. Most of these machines, if you're running 30 foot larger heads, you're going to the knob on the other side that controls the speed of it, you're going to want to run it just full bore. And then for corn, you can back that back down to about seven, six, somewhere's in there. Uh, we found out the, these style chaff spreaders like this one, the 9000s and newer, we can, we can back the the speed of that down to about five, even four. 900 series, the older ones, um, before 2006, we found out backing it down to five, the corn cobs get put, wedged in there and stop the spreaders. And okay. of course we don't have sensors on there to tell you that the spreaders aren't running and wind up plugging up the combine. What we try to do, I use the bolt right below it, like right now we've got number eight aimed at that bolt right below it. Nine's as fast as it's gonna go, of course, zero is going to shut them off. Yeah. And if you had this combine running, the thresher running, and you stand back here trying to speed up and slow these things down, you wouldn't hard, you won't be able to hardly turn that thing. Okay. I mean, you you break the knob off because it's got pressure on it. So it's an adjustment that you make without the thresher running, and then all you can do is fire it all up, stand back here, see how fast they're running. But on an average, thirty foot heads and bigger. Uh, I just run them things wide open. Okay. And it'll spread it out plenty far. Wide open on soybeans and yeah, and, and slow it down to slow about it down to yeah, like some corn. I back it down to about right, right there. On the choppers, you know, obviously, if you shove the knives all the way in on high speed, the choppers take 40 horsepower roughly. It doesn't really matter how big it is. So. We're, now we're starting to shove the knives in further to chop it up finer. And I know a lot of guys in corn, they don't use their choppers because they think it's gonna um, wear their knives out worse. Well, I'm finding out they're not, when they don't use the choppers in corn, 
we're getting so many corn cobs getting thrown off that chaff spreader and they throw cobs up into belts. Yeah. We've been putting flaps on the side to try to help prevent that. Okay. Kind of trying to convince everyone to use the choppers and corn, knock the spread board down so you don't launch them into the tractor or auger car. Yeah. Kind of bust up the cobs, chop up the stalks, you know, so they can get them through the disc rippers and, and or if they're in no-till, you know, a breakdown. It doesn't seem like to get the snow and everything. Okay. Moisture in the winter time, so. And your adjustment for the knives are back here? Yep. So, knives are right here. Like this one here would be, if that bolt was right here in the middle, that's halfway in. This bolt's right there, that's all the way in. It's like the choppers. I know the newer these combines get, they're getting, uh, they got what they call um, those L shaped chopper knives in it. They're called wind knives. Mm -hmm. So they've got them on this side and this side. The 900 series combines have got two rows of them going to our cross, which we're starting to switch them over and run all serrated flails in the middle of the, the chopper and then serrate it and then put just one wind knife here, one here on all four. Same over here. That gives it more of a spread direction. Originally it was the wind knives were going to help pull the dust off through the machine. It was going to help spread everything, which yep. it did. But we're finding out that just putting them out here, because that's the way this one's set up, they work just as good. Okay. So then you can come back. Normally, I, okay, I've got a 30-foot head. I'm going to adjust these fans back here so it's not launching material out in the standing beams. And then for corn, instead of messing with the fins, just take it. Shoot it straight to the ground. This is one other area we've been, even though this one's banned, <laughs> is this is underneath the clean grain auger, underneath the combine. Very high wear item. Wears out right in here. Wears this off. There's a right and wrong way of putting this on the machine. We see a lot of them turned around like this. They're supposed to be in like this. This is supposed to be facing the grain elevator side. The reason that's there is the boot, the slides on there, there, that's real high wear area. So instead of wearing the boot out, it'll wear this out. We'll get a little profile here of yeah. that. Kind of give you an idea of the right and the wrong way. Yeah. If I just say this combine's gonna go back to the customer and he, he wants to leave all these covers off, I'll come in here and I'll draw an arrow, left or right. they get up there and they always get in the radiator if you know you've got a shed or anything coons can hibernate in there okay first thing to do is crawl up there look off down in around that radiator to make sure they're not down in that fan shroud usually after you start running these things they things they skedaddle off but uh, we've seen them in there and the other things down in the cleaning fan uh, last year we got a big two of them out of a cleaning fan that wound up bent all the blades and wound up kind of up in around the, the clean grain auger and that was a mess. Yeah, I know. So today we're going to calibrate a New Holland Intel View 4 combine with CR combine with a New Holland header. Um, today we got the six row corn head and we are, this system has um, just your standard sensors on it. Nothing big. Make one thing that we gotta make sure is we gotta make sure that the sensors are good, that they're working, there's no wires cut, no they're not being stuck back instead of being you know down like they should be hanging down. And the second thing is to make sure that your head is kind of level, you know, as best as you can. I know it's not always easy, but it's best to do it on a level surface where the combine and the head are on the same plane and make sure your tips are all about the same. On a, on a bean head or a platform, same thing. You got the sensors on the side, the little gauges on the side, make sure they're in the same area on the, on the head. Once you've got that set, raise the head up just a little bit so that the sensors are off the ground and not being red. We're gonna go back to the monitor and we're gonna hit the back button 
We're gonna go to calibrations, and we're gonna go up here to the white bar, and, it's gonna, and we're gonna say header. We're gonna calibrate the header. So this is a warning message saying park the combine on level ground, have it idled, and then push OK once you're ready to go. So when we hit OK, it's gonna tell us to pulse the header down. So on your on your joystick, hit the button once and let go. What this will do is it'll lower the head to determine the lowest point. And you see where that sensor just was holding it up a little bit? We don't want that to happen. All the sensors need to be on the ground. So right now it's determining the lowest point of it where the head is. The monitor will beep and say pulse the header up. So pulsing the header up, it raises the head. On step two, it will determine the maximum height the feeder house can raise the head. This is just so it knows where it raises and lowers at and how to determine the position. When that's done, it says step three, pulse it down. When we do this, the pulsing the header down, it'll determine the weight of the head. So it's gonna lower it down to a point where the sensors are just barely touching. And then it's reading the voltage based off of how much hydraulic flow there is. This, this step takes a little time. That step is complete. It'll beep at you and go to step four, which means pulse the header up. When you pulse the header up, it'll actually drop the head to know back to the ground level and then slowly raise it up to determine the, the, the lower 10% and then it'll raise it up to the upper 10% of the sensor so it knows the range of the sensor. Calibration is complete. Now the sensors can work. So once you've once you got the head calibrated, we want to set our R button. Our, we have a memory position of one and two, so you want to lower your head to the position you want it, and then toggle what what position you want. Two is the middle, one is forward, and then you just with the with the thresher engaged, the header engaged, you hit and hold the button until the monitor beep at you, and then you do it again with number two, push and hold the R button with number two change your position you got you got to change it a little bit but those are just so your quick memories it'll automatically toggle back and forth to those positions what would be the reason for having two positions Chris so typically I run number one close to the ground so like in down corn or something yeah. and then run at number two you want to run that at your normal operating speed so you got good clear cutting you want to raise that up a little bit higher so you can run faster and more smooth and then being so close to the ground and damaging your 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 tips and stuff so okay. so one of the biggest phone calls I get is my moisture sensor is not working some moisture is not moving not changing so there's a couple things we need to do number one I always tell people is make sure you clean this thing out If you're going through, you get done with beans, you're going to corn, I want you to clean this out. If it's gonna, if it rained overnight, I want you to clean this out because obviously beans swell up and it plugs this, this auger up. So pull these two pins, pull this lid off, and boom, everything comes out. If there's a lot of uh, like crap in here, meaning like stems and husks and stuff like that, that's gonna jam this auger up. And this little motor is only capable of handling about five amps. I'll show you the fuse in a little bit, but we wanna make sure this auger is clean. We wanna make sure this housing is clean. We wanna put our hands up here, get this whole thing cleaned out, make sure there's nothing in there that's gonna basically resist the, the turning of this auger. Another thing I've actually witnessed is Sometimes this plastic gets mold, uh, gets grooves built into it, and these grooves actually this auger just sits here and spins on it. Sometimes those grooves actually will resist, and I've had to actually clean these up and shave them down smooth before. So make sure this is all nice and clean, and put, and then all you gotta do is put it back in there. It's kind of tricky, but 
there's that rod that goes in the middle and it, I can't push it up. All you gotta do is take the auger, it's sticking at the bottom, you can just barely see it. Just take your thumb and spin it and try to push this up. And once you get it set, you can put these pins back in. So another issue is when this thing is plugged up with moldy beans or corn, a lot of times the moisture sensor is not gonna work correctly. So what we're gonna do is take the wing nuts off. And what we wanna do is clean that fin. Now, get this thing off. Should have spun these off. So a lot of times there'll be crap and mold and sticky beans and stuff on this. All you wanna do is run your fingers across it just a couple times to make sure that the fin is clean. This is the actual sensor. So we wanna make sure that sensor, that little pin there is clean. And that will, that'll determine, that'll make sure that everything that comes across, it's gonna be read correctly and not, not giving you false readings. Um, if you don't have the pin, you have an older sensor and typically the older sensor was down here in the bottom. It was copper color. If there was a copper color sensor and if it turned green, you have a bad sensor. That copper has to, has to be copper colored. So install it back in there, put the wing nuts on and we'll check one more thing. So the, another big issue that I have is that let's say your moisture is not changing. You clean this out, but it still does not work. Number, the biggest culprit is this fuse. This fuse is basically the motor. The motor is a five amp fuse only. See, it says five. Check that sensor, make sure it's good. If you install a bigger fuse than a five, you have a very good chance of blowing this motor. This motor is not very strong. All it does is it turns that little auger and the more resistance, the more like, let's say you have a dirty sample. That sample with that dirt, that cobs, the husk, the anything, that more res gives you more resistance is gonna blow this fuse. So make sure you have plenty of five amp fuses on hand. Make sure this thing is clean and you should not have any more issues. If you put a five amp fuse in and it blows instantly, your motor is bad. You need to replace it. Those are, those are just a simple 10 minute deal. You take this whole box off, unscrew with a couple bolts, this motor slides out, you put a new one in and you're off to races.